baby on the deals. Today's lecture is going to be on buffer pool, right? This is the how we're going to manage memory inside of our database system. So before we jump into the material, uh, turn this on. No, not today. Okay. Um, the two upcoming database talks that I think are, are interesting that you guys want to check out. So there's a talk today in the eighth floor in Gates from the co-founder of Relational AI. I actually don't know what they're doing. I know who the person is. I don't know what the new company is doing. Uh, but so he's a semi-famous dude. So this, this should, should be an interesting talk. So this would be, I think, sort of databases meets machine learning and machine learning meets, meets databases. And then Thursday next week, we'll have the second session in our seminar series on hardware accelerated databases with the uh, co-founder of MapD. MapD is a, an, another GPU database system. So that'll be uh, on Thursday on the fourth floor in the CIC building. Right? Where there's, if you come out of the elevators, you go right, uh, well, left, pretending we're elevator, but there's these glass doors, go inside that, and the talk will be in there. OK? OK. So uh, as we said last class, uh, the, the last two lectures were all about organizing uh, database files on disk. Right of how we're going to lay out the, 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 the files. And inside of them, we have pages. And inside the pages, we, we lay out our data. Um, and then we sort of punted on this, this idea of how are we actually going to bring this into memory and, and manage that. Right? Because we said we can't have our data system operate directly on files on disk. Everything always has to be brought in memory before we can even read and write to it. So that's what today's lecture is about, Right, the second part of how are we going to actually make, make decisions on, on where to bring in the pages into memory, and then how do we make decisions to evict them when we run out of space? Right? Because the, the size of our database is, is most often going to be much larger than the amount of memory that we have, so we can't keep everything in memory. So the, another way to think about the problem is, is discussing this, this, sort of, this trade-off between sort of spatial and temporal control of, of data. So spatial control is what we've talked about so far. It's, like, it's, it's basically how we're going to write files to disk, where we're going to lay out our pages on disk. Right? And the goal of this was, as we said, is that since disks are faster at doing sequential access, uh, definitely for spinning disk hard drive, because it's a mechanical arm that has to jump around on the platter and read, and read, read the tracks, but even in SSDs as well, if we can have the data that we know is going to be accessed together uh, in a query, physically located next to each other inside of our disks, then we'll have, we'll have faster access. Because right? so now, again, it's thinking of the, the worst case scenario of the spinning, spinning disk hard drive, the arm has to jump around all over the platter every single time I need to read a single page. That's going to be really slow. Or if I can just plop the arm down in one location and then read sequentially a bunch of pages, that's going to be much faster. So now what we're talking about today is uh, the second issue of thinking about the temporality of the data we're accessing. Right? And this means how we're actually going to control when do we read pages into memory and when do we write them out back out to disk, if necessary. Right? So we're not discussing where we're going to write these things to disk. Uh, we'll talk a little about where we actually store them in memory, but overall it's, it's you know, whether the pages are next to each other in memory. For our purposes here, it doesn't actually matter. In real systems, if you're in memory, it does. But for our purposes here, we, we ignore that. So it's really about then deciding how we're actually going to, uh, when we actually want to move data back and forth. And the goal here, obviously, is since the disk is so much slower than, than, than DRAM and memory, we want to minimize the number of stalls that will incur because we have to read data from disk. Right? It's, in some ways, it's unavoidable, as I said, because the database is going to be larger than the total amount of memory that we have. But if we're smart about how we stage things and time our accesses and writebacks, we can, we can minimize this impact. Right? The way to think about this is if I know I'm going to see, read the same page over and over and over and over again, then maybe I don't want to write that out the disk and I always keep that in memory. But if I read something once and I'll never read it again, then I want to go ahead and maybe evict it and throw it away. So these are the kind of things that we're, we're going to discuss today. And this provides, again, the, this overview diagram that I showed last class. We've covered the bottom part. We, we know how to lay out uh, pages into files. And now it's the second part above this, right? the buffer pool. Right, the buffer pool is going to be the in-memory cache that the, the database system is going to ma maintain of the pages that it read from the files on disk. And we said before that this looks a lot like virtual memory from the operating system, but the operating system, as we'll see as we go along, is not going to do as a good job as our database system 
because we fully, not fully, but we have a better understanding of exactly what queries want to do, and therefore we can prepare ourselves and read and write data from disk into memory accordingly in a way that the operating system can't do. Because the operating system only sees like the reads and writes uh, sort of at a granular level. It just sees the reads and sees the writes on a page. It doesn't understand anything about how the actual queries are accessing those pages because the OS treats all pages the same. Whereas we'll see as we go along inside our database system, some pages correspond to indexes, some pages correspond to intermediate results of queries, and not all of them are the same. It should not always be treated the same. But the OS doesn't know this, uh, so it can't do as good a job as, as we can. So for today's agenda, we're going to first start off talk about the, the buffer pool manager. Right? At a high level, it's pretty easy to implement. Uh, the, basic, the basic concept of it, but we'll see the more uh, complicated things you can do in the actual policies you maintain inside of this and for, for placement and allocation. Um, and then we'll talk briefly about what do the other memory pools look like in, inside the database system. Okay? So, at a high level, the buffer pool is just a large region of memory that the database system is going to manage in its own address space. And it's going to use this to, again, copy pages that, it, that the Queries want to access from the disk and put them into the buffer pool. All right? So you just sort of think of this, the buffer pool is just some large memory region, like a giant byte array. And then it's going to split up the byte array into what are called frames. Right? And these will be this, the same size, size as, as your pages. So I think there was a question last time whether the size of a page for you know, the, the, the large overflow pages, are they different than the, the, the regular tuple pages? Everything's always going to be the same page size because they need to fit into these frames. Right? And that's how it's going to figure out you know, where, the next, where the stopping and starting point for every page is. Because otherwise, you have to have an indirection layer to figure out you know, how, the length of things at their variable length. So we call these, these open spaces frames, right? the slot where you can actually write data in. I'll try to use frame as much as possible, but you can sort of see how the same concept uh, at a high level just has to have different names in the database system. Right? So we have a file. We can have pages. Inside of pages, we can have slots. And the slots are where we can store tuples. And then inside of our buffer pool, what we may want to call slots, we're going to call frames. Right? It's the space where we, we can write a page. So what happens is when, when the database system, uh, when a query wants to read a page, we're just going to go down on disk and make an exact copy of this uh, in, our, in, our, in our buffer pool. Right? So if a query wants to read page one, there's an exact copy of that page uh, in, in, that, in a frame in our buffer pool. Right? So there's no transformation. There's no marshalling or, or, or serialization process of copying the data from, from the disk into the page. It's an exact byte-for-byte -byte copy. Um, if you bring in compression, that complicates things slightly. But for our purposes here, how it's being stored on disk is exactly how it's being, going to be stored in memory. And our database system knows how to operate on, on that structure. right? It knows about slotted page layouts. It knows how to operate on the tuples inside of them. No, Windows, I do not want to upgrade. <laughs> uh, OK. So the. For this purpose here, again, I, I showed my example before. I talked about how the execution engine wants to say, I want page number two. And then there had to be something that says, well, here's the, here's the frame in my buffer pool where you can go find the copy of page two. And this is called the page table. You sort of essentially just think of this as, as a hash map that maps page IDs to a, 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 a frame of where it can be stored. right? And so if I want to do my lookup and say, you know, I want page two, I go to my page table. It either tells me it's there and where and what frame it's in in my buffer pool, or it's going to tell me it's not there, in which case I have to go to my page directory and find where that location is on disk, and then decide a, you know, where I can copy that frame into this. So now we want to talk a little bit about, about uh, you know, thread safety in this, because again, if, if, you're, if it's single-threaded, then this, this hash table doesn't need to be protected. right? You just, you just go in, just find the entry you want, and then just read it. But because we're on disk and because modern systems have a lot of uh, CPU cores, we're going to have multiple threads, multiple queries running at the same time, all accessing this, this page table. So what we don't want to happen is we don't want to maybe access a page. All right, we go to the page table, we find out actually where it is, and then we start reading it. And then some other thread comes along and says, well, I, I'm taking this page away, and goes and replaces, replaces it. So what we're going to do is, anytime we want to access a page, we're going to have to pin it in the page table. Right? Think of this like a, a simple reference counter. This is just you know, a, a, a counter that says the number of active queries that are accessing this page right, right now. 
Okay, and we store this in the page table and not inside the page themselves because we don't actually need to, to make this, this reference counter durable, right? So when the page gets evicted, the, the reference counter doesn't need to be stored as well, right? So we're gonna store everything in, in the in memory, uh, in the in memory page table. And so when a page is pinned, anybody else may, can still come and go find page three, in this case here, and still read it. It's just the buffer pool manager is not allowed to evict it because it knows somebody is actually accessing right now. So now, say I come along, and another thread comes along, and it wants to read, read a page that's not either one and three, uh, and it's not in there. Uh, so then it's going to go ahead and actually take a, take a, well, a lock on this location. right? So I want to read this page. I know that it's not there. I'll find a, a, a slot in my, in my frame in my page table where I know I want to store this. And so I take a, take a latch, and then I can go ahead and then fetch the data that I need and update the page entry. Right, so this is the way. Again, I I want to I want to read a page that's not there, so then I have to find a place where I can store the reference to that page in my page table. So I take a latch on that on that location, then in the background go fetch it, and then update the page table. Right, and then at this point I I release my latch because I've done whatever I wanted to do. If I just had to read it, then I don't need to pin it. If I'm going to modify it, then I want to then I want to pin it. Okay. Actually, sorry, that's not true. Let me be more clear. If I'm going to read it, I pin it. Uh, even if I'm going to write to it, I pin it. But I don't need to maintain any additional information if I'm just reading it. As soon as I'm done reading it, I can throw the pin away. If I'm writing to it, I have to maintain a dirty bit, a dirty flag that says, I modified this thing. And this is to prevent the database system from writing it back out the disk or just throwing it away, because it knows that some other query modified the page uh, when it was when it when it accessed it, and therefore we have to make sure that those changes eventually make it back to disk. So that's what the dirty flag does for us. So the one thing I need to discuss is the this distinction between locks and latches. Uh, if you're coming from an operating system background, right, you may have, you know you may just refer to everything you know as locks. In a database system, at least in the database world, locks are different than latches. So if you're in an operating system world. A lock is basically what we would call a latch here. Like you think of like a mutex would be a, a, what we're calling a latch. So a latch is going to be used to protect the internal data structures of the database system. So my example I showed before, I want to write to my hash table. I set a latch to prevent anybody else from modifying that location because I want to write into it. And that latch can be implemented as a mutex. Uh, it can also be implemented as a spin lock, which is an unfortunate name because that muddies the, the story here. In the database where a lock we'll see later on, this is going to be a higher level construct, like a logical construct, that we're going to use to protect database entities. So I can take a lock on a tuple, right? Or I can take a lock on, 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 a, uh, on, on, a, on a on a database or a table. But I can't take a latch on this because that's the underlying data structure. So when I take a lock, I would have to take a latch to update the lock table. So is this clear? Locks are for high-level constructs, and we'll see this later on when we talk about you know, uh, concurrency control. The latches are what we're going to use to, to protect the internal data structures. So in SQL, I can take locks. I can't take latches. Latches are, are actually how the data system is actually implemented. OK? And as I said, this, in, if you're coming from an OS background, you would call a latch a lock. But in databases, we, we use the term latch. OK? The other thing we want to talk about is the distinction between the page table and the page directory. So the page directory is the on-disk uh, information about where to find pages for a given page ID. So as I said, like the, 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 if our database is broken across multiple files, the page directory could say, oh, page 123 is in this file at this offset. Page 456, 456 is, is in another file at this offset. So any changes we make to the page directory when we bring it into memory has to then get written out the disk because when we if we restart the system and come back we need to know where our pages are. The page table is the in-memory data structure that we're going to use to figure out inside of our buffer pool how to map the page IDs to a frame if if, if it's been copied in. And so for this we don't need to write this out the disk at all because if we crash and come back we don't care we don't care what the buffer pool looked like the last time we crashed because we're going to repopulate it uh, as queries start executing and reading, start reading data. So the page directory, again, is on disk. 
It's mapping page IDs to locations on files. The page table is in memory, and it's mapping page IDs to slots in the buffer pool. And we don't need to, to, to make that durable. Okay? All right, so the, as I said, anytime we want to go into the page table and do a lookup, we always have to take a latch to make sure that nobody swaps out the thing we're trying to read as, as we're trying to read it, right? But this becomes a contention point, because now if you have a lot of threads all trying to access the page table at the same time, and then maybe taking latches, uh, you, you know, do something really coarse grain, like a latch for the entire page table, or you can take latches for you know, individual elements or buckets. But regardless, if you have a lot of threads and everyone's trying to do the same thing at the same time, then this is going to become a major bottleneck in our system. So one way to alleviate this problem is actually to have multiple buffer pools. So in my example, I just showed I had a single page table and a single buffer pool. There's no reason the database system could, couldn't have multiple ones. And that way, so basically what happened is your, if, you, if your query comes along and it says, I want page 123, you can just hash that 123 and that will map you to a buffer pool instance. And then inside of that buffer pool instance, then it has its own page table and its own region of memory. Right, this is sort of a way to partition the, the workload across multiple buffer pool instances so that everyone's not trying to acquire the same latches at the same time. So there's a bunch of different ways you can implement this. You can just sort of say the database instance itself or the database management system instance just can have multiple buffer pools and they're allocated, uh, you know, they're split evenly for the total amount of memory you want to allocate for your buffer pool. Uh, you can have a buffer pool per, per, per database. You can have a buffer pool per page type. So you can say, here's my buffer pool for index pages. Here's my buffer pool for data pages or tuple pages. So these are a bunch of systems that, that support this. MySQL, DB2, Oracle, Sybase, and SQL Server, and Formix. So with the exception of MySQL, although MySQL is, is, is really good, I would call these other ones below it enterprise databases. Right? These are like what traditional old companies would, would, would actually use. Right? But MySQL is super common. It's used everywhere now, though. Um, so in the case of MySQL, as far as I know, at least for version 5, I haven't checked version 8, you can only declare that you have multiple buffer pool instances. In the commercial systems, they have way more knobs that you can, you can, you can change and tune, and they support all these different uh, variations. In the back, yes? So your question is, if you have multiple buffer pool instances, how do you map what, sorry, what was the second part? Oh, his question is, all right, so if I have multiple buffer pool instances, how do I map a page ID? How do I take a page ID and know what instance I should look in? Yeah, so the easiest way to do is just hashing, right? I have, I have five buffer pool instances. For a given page ID, I hash it, mod five, and that'll tell me you know, which instance I go to, right? And, that mean, and that's immutable, right? So no matter what, you know, uh, the same page ID is always going to map to the same page, buffer pool instance. You can do something real simple too, like you can do uh, range partitioning, but that's, I don't think anybody actually does this, right? You could say any with, anything with page ID 0 to 1,000 goes to this one, 1,001 to 2,000 goes to this one. The hashing one's more common because that handles the case where the, if the database is always growing, your, your, your range of page IDs increases. You don't have to you know, reshuffle things around. Um, okay, and again, the... the, the, the Reason why we want to do this, because we'll reduce contention on the latches as we, as we go into our page table, and we can actually improve our locality. So if we know that we see certain queries are doing, uh, have certain access patterns, uh, having a buffer pool instance for, for maybe indexes versus the tuples, we can sort of isolate the two buffer pool uh, instances to, and choose different replacement policies or, or allocation policies for each of those different access patterns. All right, and we'll see examples, as, examples of this in a second. So, so again, so the, the, the kind of things we're talking about here, again, these are the things that the operating system can't do for you because it doesn't know what you're actually trying to do, right? So, again, because we know what our pages actually mean in some ways, right, we know what, whether it's index versus data, we can allocate different buffer pool instances uh, like this. Another thing we can do that, uh, that's right, no clicker, that the OS can't always do correctly is to do prefetching. So, Prefetching is basically says that I know I'm going to go ahead and uh, read, read subsequent pages given what my query is trying to do. So rather than waiting for me to then try to access that page in the page table, see that there's no entry, you know, get a, get a page fault where I go, have to go fetch the page that I need, I can go ahead and start prefetching pages ahead of time 
because I know my query is going to need it in, uh, in, in the future. So let's say I have a simple query that's Q1 that's doing sequential scan across the entire uh, table. Right? And I, I have my pages 0 to 5. And my buffer pool is en empty. So in the first case, I read page 0. It's not there. So I go ahead and fetch it in. Uh, and I do this as, as I scan along. But if I recognize that my query is essentially going to read every page, then maybe at some point I recognize that, oh, I, I know I'm going to read page 2 and 3. So while I'm accessing page 1, or I'm retrieving page 1 and putting my buffer pool, let me go ahead and prefetch 2 and 3, put that into my buffer pool. And then that way, when now my query keeps on going, I don't have to stall because the, the next pages I need are already there. Right? So the operating system can do this in some, some cases, right? It, it can recognize that when you're doing a scan across uh, a large file, it'll essentially do the same thing. It'll start trying to prefetch, prefetch your, your pages. In this example here, the operating system could probably do this or can do this because we're accessing a file sequentially. But not every access pattern of the database system is going to be sequential like this. Right? So a very common case is to do index scans or index range scans. So again, so say we have an index here, and we're going to run a, we want to run a range scan where we're going to traverse the tree. doesn't matter whether it's a B plus tree or, or whatever data structure. Just, it's a tree. And we're going to traverse the tree, get to some leaf page, and then scan along the leaf, leaf pages to find all the data that we need. So the very first thing we have to do when our query starts, we have to read the, the index page. Right, because we have to know, you know, we have to, to know where our entry point into the index is. So the, for this one, we go ahead and patch, fetch page, page index page zero, bring that into our buffer pool. Then we, we jump down maybe to this side of the, of the tree, and we want to fetch index page one. We go ahead and get that. But now we're going to go down this to to the other side of the tree, and start scanning across the the leaf pages like that. So now we're going to read page three and page five. But the OS may think that, oh, well, I think you're actually going to read page two, and let me go ahead and prefetch that, that for you, which is not actually what we want, right? So we want page three and five, so we could, the, the database system could recognize, oh, well, I didn't go to page two, I wanted to go to page three, and then the next leaf page that I'm going to scan across is page five, so not page four. So let me go ahead and prefetch those two guys, All right? The OS can't do this because it doesn't know what's inside these pages. Right? We know in our database system that, we, you know, because we, we're the one that actually built this data structure. We built the tree. We know what pages are there. We know what the query is trying to do, right? Because we have the SQL. We have the query plan. So we can then infer from that what, what pages we think you're going to need. Now, this does mean we have to do some extra work and, like, you know, maintain some extra metadata, possibly in the index, to know what our neighbor page is, right? So we can go ahead and prefetch. We have, to, we have rules to recognize that I think we're going to do a sequential scan along the leaf pages or index scan along the leaf pages and recognize it, it, you know, that's, that's an opportunity for us to prefetch. It's more work, but, the, but the, the benefit can be quite substantial. And this is actually a very common access pattern to do range scans along uh, a, a, an index like this. The next kind of optimization we can do is called scan sharing. So with scan sharing, the basic idea is that if we have queries that are running at the same time and they're accessing the same data, rather than treating every, every query as a, you know, in its own island by itself and just making decisions about what pages to fetch in and out you know, for each individual query, the database system can recognize that the queries are trying to do the, basically the same thing or they're trying to read the same data. It may not be the exact same query, but they're going to have to read the same data. And then we can just have the the, the queries sort of piggyback off each other and reuse the data that we've already pulled into our buffer pool to avoid having to swap things out unnecessarily and incur more disk writes. Right, so the way to sort of, again, think about this is that if I'm doing sequential scans, I have my one query starts, the second query comes behind it, and it starts a little bit later, I maybe want to pick up where the, 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 the first guy is already running and reuse the data that it's already pulled in rather than starting everything from scratch. Right? And the, way, the way we're going to implement these scans, and we'll see this when we talk about query processing, it's essentially a cursor for each query that keeps track of what pages it's read as, as it goes along the, the, the table scan, and it knows what, you know, how far it's got to go and what pages that, that it's missing. Right? So the, this is supported, again, as far as I know, only in the major commercial systems. 
Right? So this will be a reoccurring theme throughout the semester. We'll see that the, the very expensive enterprise databases do way more sophisticated things than the open source ones, just because they've had a lot of money and a lot of people spending time to fix these things, you know, make these things work as well, good as possible. So as far as I know, for the uh, scan sharing, which we'll see in the next slide, this is fully supported in IBM DB2 and SQL Server. Oracle only supports what are called cursor sharing if you actually run the exact same query at the exact same time. Right? If there's any sort of minor deviation in the where clause or even like the, the, what the select output is, it doesn't think that this, they can read the same data and it treats them as separate, separate beasts. So to do scan sharing, basically for, for the, the first query starts, it has its cursor, it's scanning through, and then the second query's cursor will, will recognize I can, I can run along with the, with the first guy and just keep track of what data it, has, it missed from not starting at the beginning so that it can loop back around and, and pick everything that it missed. So a simple example would be like this. Say I have query one, and it's doing sequential scan. It's going to read every page to compute the, the sum on the value. So when it starts, it's at the beginning. There's nothing, nothing in our buffer pool. So we go ahead and fetch page zero, and we just keep going down and, and to get the second page here. Now we want to read page three, and then we, have to, we, we only have three frames in our buffer pool, so we have to evict the page. So assuming we're doing a simple replacement policy, we just pick the, the page that was last accessed, that would be page zero. So you want to go ahead and throw that away so that we can put in page three, the next page that we need. But now during this time, query two starts, and it basically wants to execute this, the, the, you know, it's not the exact same query, it's computing an average instead of a sum, but it's still going to read all the same pages. So if we started from the beginning, what's the problem? The first page that this, this query needs is page zero, but that was actually the last page we just evicted. So now what would happen is we'd have to go back into our buffer pool and, and figure out, all right, well, you know, I need to make space. Let me go evict a page, all right? And it sucks because we just, we just fetched that, you know, we just, we just had it in memory and we lost it. So we, now we have to pay another, another disk read. So instead with, with scan sharing, you can recognize that these, these two queries need to read the same data in the same pages. So Q2 just hops along with Q1. It reads the same, same, same pages, right? So one disk read brings it to the buffer pool, and there's sort of a notification system that says, all right, you two guys need these pages. It's now ready. So then Q1 finishes because it reaches all the pages, and then Q2 recognizes, oh, well, I need to go back and get the other the pages that I missed, right? So again, this, this, by being smarter about what we know queries want to do, we can avoid having unnecessary disk reads in a way that would be difficult to do with, uh, if, if you don't know anything about what the queries are actually trying to do. Another optimization is to do what's called buffer pool bypass. So we'll see this in a second, but these sequential scans are, 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 are problematic because they're gonna pollute our cache with data that we actually don't, may, may not need again in the future. So in my, my last example on the last slide, I, did was, I was doing sequential scan on the table. So as I read a page, I brought it into my buffer pool, I did, you know, did whatever query processing I wanted on it, and then I just went on to the next, next page. But now the, that, that page I just read is probably not going to be needed in, again in the future, but it's the last thing I just put in my buffer pool. So I, and, and I end up maybe evicting data that, that I actually do want to keep in there, but I had to do that because I had to make space for all these uh, pages I'm reading as, as I'm doing the scan. So with buffer pool bypass, the basic idea is that the database system can say, all right, I'm going to do a sequential scan, and I know that this data is probably not going to be needed by anybody else. So rather than going, paying the overhead of updating the page table and putting it in a frame in the buffer pool, I'll just keep it a local copy in my private memory for my query. And then when I'm done with it, I just throw it away. Right? So this avoids having to go update the page table, update the buffer pool. I just update my own lo local copy of it. All right? So in, in Formix, these are called light scans. Uh, in Postgres, we'll see in a second, they basically have their own private buffer for queries as well if you're doing a sequential scan. I actually don't know whether it actually goes to the buffer pool manager. I just know that it maintains its own little private buffer for every query. So another thing we need to talk about now is the, the OS page cache. So the operating system is going to maintain for, for the file system its own cache of pages that it reads. Right? If you ever look on HTOP, uh, on, on Linux, right? You'll see how much the, 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 the how much memory your processes are using, uh, you know, on the heap. But then there's also going to be the OS page cache 
of copies of pages that it's read from, from the file system. So if you don't do anything special, when you open up a file in your, in your program and read a bunch of data in, the OS is going to copy, make copies of that in, in its own file system or page cache. All right, this is different than virtual memory. But now the problem is, if we do this, then now every time I read a page in my buffer pool in my database system, the OS is going to make a copy of it, and then I'm going to have another copy of it in my, uh, in my, in, in my database system. So it's, it's double the amount of memory for reading the same data. So most database systems turn off this page cache. And the way you do it is you pass the odirect flag in, in libc when you open up a file and say, I don't want this file to be backed by the, the, the file system cache. I'm going to manage, manage it myself. So this avoids having, again, these redundant copies of pages. Uh, it allows you to have, again, full control over the eviction policies of how things are evicted out of memory. Right? As far as I know, uh, most major database systems, with except from one, tells you to turn off uh, the page cache in the operating system because they want to manage memory itself. The major system that I know that does use it is actually Postgres. Postgres actually uses the, the OS page cache. And they argue that the, this is not a significant problem for them because the, the OS, it still has its own buffer pool, but, it's, but it still relies on the OS page cache. And just by having that sort of an extra layer, it's one less thing that they have to manage and they, the, it's a minimal impact on performance. So let's, let's see how, actually how this works. All right, so this is Postgres uh, running on, on the machine back in my office. Let me connect to it here. So the first thing I, I, I want to show you is what the page cache actually looks like. Um, wrong one. Again, if you run HTOP, it's kind of hard to see there. I don't, I don't have a laser pointer. Right, so this is the amount of memory that the, the, the system is using. Right, so this green bar here, that's the resident memory of, of the processes running on the system. Then all of this yellow stuff here is the, the, the OS file system cache. Right, so this machine has 32 gigs of RAM. The resident set size of the processes running on my shoot machine is only 5 gigs. And the rest is being used by the OS page cache. Right, so we can flush this. So if you pass in this command here, sync echo3, and you pass it to this uh, special location in the, in the proc file system, this will flush all the page caches in, in for my system. So now if I go back and look at HTOP again, right, now my, my resident set size is still 5 gigs, but my, but my total amount of memory my system is using is, 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 is now exactly 5 gigs, because the, the, the OS file system cache is gone. So let's go into Postgres. So we're going to use the same two tables that, that I used last time to show you the difference between decimals and reals, right? I think it's like 10 million entries. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn off uh, parallel workers, right? Again, this, this, they, it's only one query running at a time. So what we're going to do is we can execute a query that will just, just do that same summation that we had before. So now I'm going to pass in, I'm going to use explain. And I'm going to explain analyze, which actually runs the query and shows you the query plan. But I'm going to pass in this extra flag called buffers that's going to show you uh, what percentage of the data that or pages we read to execute this query will be either in the, the buffer pool cache or in the uh, or or I had to read it actually on disk. Actually, so let me let me also let me let me restart Postgres too, so it, it there's nothing in the in the file system cache. Sorry, there's nothing in, in its buffer pool cache. So at this point, I flushed the file system buffers, and I restarted Postgres, so there's nothing in memory that I can use. Everything's always going to have to go to disk. So now, uh, yeah, execute this query. Right, so oh, it, did the, it did the parallel scan, but that's OK. Actually, let me restart this. Blow that away, blow that away. Come back here, turn off parallel workers, good, okay, same query. All right, so this part here, 
this told you that for, to do this sequential scan on this table, that it had to read uh, 44,000 pages, right? So this is saying that there's nothing, there's nothing in the cache that it actually was able to reuse. So now if I come back and execute the same query again, now it says that, um, can I highlight this? Yeah, here. Now it says hit 32. I'll explain what that is in a second, right? This is actually the private cache for, the, for, the, for this query. It's always going to be 30, 32 pages, right? But then the, 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 the number of pages we read from disk went down by 32 because we, we had 32 in our, in our buffer pool, right? So we can force the database system to fetch everything into, into its buffer pool. So it has this thing called uh, uh, PG Warm, right? It's a, it's a special extension for Postgres that comes with it when you install Postgres. This tells it basically pre-warm my buffer pool by reading everything, right? So we execute that, and it's going to come back and tell us that it, 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 it read 44,000 pages and into our, our buffer pool, right? So now when I go back and run that same query, my hit ratio went up, or my, the number of hits went up. Um, I still had to read some data from disk, right? Let me take a guess what's the issue here. Why, did, why wasn't everything in the buffer pool? It's not large enough, exactly, right? So you set, when you, when, you, when you set the data system up, you say how much memory you want to use for the buffer pool, right? The data system has to be told that, because otherwise it just takes everything, right? So that's why we only had, uh, we had, we didn't, wasn't, everything wasn't always, we didn't, all of our page reads, all of our pages we want to access were in our buffer pool. So what we can do now is go back to the Postgres configuration. Right, Postgres has this flag, has something called shared buffers, right? So we want to set this to be the right size. So for this, if we go back here, we know we had to read, we had to read this number of pages, right? Postgres pages are eight kilobytes. So what we're going to want to do is we're going to store, we want to have set our buffer pool size to be eight kilobytes times 44284. So that'll be uh, 44284 times eight. All right, so about 355 megabytes. So now we go back to this guy. Let's round up, 356. All right, so now again, we're setting the, the buffer pool size to be 300, 356 megabytes. We got to restart Postgres to tell it to, to take that in effect. All right, then we go back here. Reconnect to our database. I'm going to pre-warm the table. And then now when I run my query, there you go. The hit went to exactly what we wanted. Or, oh, sorry. I don't know where my cursor is. There it is. Yeah, right there. See? So to do this, we didn't have to read anything from, 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 from the database. Or to start read anything from disk, everything was in our buffer pool. All right, the reason why I like using Postgres is because like, it almost is a textbook implementation of the database system. Yes? Is the buffer pool in the five gigs that Alex gave us back to the or is that So his question is, 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 the, is the buffer pool allocated where? Sorry, in the... In the... So you showed, uh, you, you used HTOP and you showed uh, how, the, how the memory was partitioned for so which part is, uh, uh, okay, so, yeah, so his question is, I showed this version of HTOP before, and I said the green bars for memory was the resident memory of processes, and his question is, where's the buffer pool? Is it, is it in this resident memory, or is it in the file system cache? It is in the resident memory. It's literally calling malloc inside of the process, and that shows up in, in part of the green bars here. The, it doesn't have any control over the file system cache. That is all managed by the operating system. That's the subsequent bars. So the, so the file system decides, the file, oh, sorry, the operating system decides how much it wants to allocate or, or split up the memory for the file system cache versus the, the memory for processes, right? Postgres doesn't, doesn't have any control over that. The OS just does whatever it wants to do. 
So I want to show you how we know that the, uh, the database system is hitting the file system cache uh, in case of Postgres. So if I go back to, um, right, so this query took me, uh, it takes about 12 milliseconds. So let's just run it. Or it takes 700 milliseconds, right? So I run it multiple times, it's always going to take the same amount, roughly. Now it's actually getting faster. All right, there it goes, right? So it fluctuates. So in this case here now, if I restart Postgres, this will blow away the buffer pool, right, from the process. If I now go back here, turn timing back on, make sure I'm connected, turn off parallel threads. So at this point, I restarted the database, the buffer pool is gone, there's nothing in the buffer pool. I'm not gonna run PG warm, I'm just gonna run the query and see how, how, how fast it is. And if it's the same speed as, as this 700, 740 milliseconds, if it's the same speed as that, then we know it's hitting the file system cache. Right? It's, it's, it's a little bit slower. Right? So if I, was, if I blow away the file system cache, I actually did this in the beginning. I was roughly about 1.2 seconds. Now I'm 700 milliseconds. There was nothing in the buffer pool, but the, the, file, the, the operating system has it cached. So the, the data system can go ahead and read that. So again, this is specific to Postgres. Most data systems do not rely on the, the page cache of the operating system, right? Because they want to manage all memory themselves. Okay? So is this clear? And again, we can use explain, uh, explain, analyze with, with the buffers, and it'll tell us uh, what percentage of the queries are hitting the buffer pool. In this case here, since I didn't run PG warm, it still has to read a lot of things from, from, the, from the file system. Actually, that execution time is pretty slow. Now we'll deal with that later. But maybe because we're, we're running analyze. No, we'll, we'll deal with that later. Okay. All right. So th th these demos are sort of just to, to expose to you or show you that like, the things I'm talking about here, you can actually see in some ways without reading the Postgres code, you can see the behavior that matches up with, with the policies that were described. All right, so the next thing we want to talk about is how do we actually make decisions on what frames or what pages to remove from our buffer pool, right? It's super easy when everything's in, we have enough memory because we just fetch the pages in and we don't worry about you know, making new space. But obviously, again, we, we, our, our database may be larger than the amount of page, memory we have, so we have to make decisions about how to make room for new pages we want to fetch uh, and, 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 and Vic from our buffer pool to put the new one in. So the, there's a couple sort of trade-offs or things we're going to care about in our, in our replacement policy. Right? One is obviously correctness. And by correctness, I mean that we don't want to write up, you know, we don't want to throw away data that a transaction just updated or a query just updated before actually making it out to disk, right? Because then, then we lose everything. We want our re re replacement policy to be accurate in that we don't want to do the dumbest thing and like evict the most important page because you know we're, we're going to need it right away, right? We want to have a good estimation of making decisions about pages that we know we think we're not going to need, so we can go ahead and throw them away. We want this to be fast because. As I said, when I do a lookup into the page table and my, my page is not there, and then I need to decide what page to remove, I have to figure out what page I want to take out and, and put a latch there. So I'm holding a latch while I'm running this replacement policy. And if, it, if my replacement policy is like, you know, MP complete and takes days to run, then that's bad because I'm holding that latch during that entire time. So you want this thing to be as fast as possible. And of course, we want to have a low metadata overhead because we don't want to have to store you know, a ton of extra data that may be larger than the actual page itself just to figure out what page we, we want to remove. So this cache replacement policy or buffer replacement policy, this is like one of the oldest problems in CS. The literature goes back to like the 1950s, 1960s. Um, there are some things that, that, we can, that we can apply from newer systems and newer would be like 1990s 
that we can do uh, smarter things than sort of the, the general approach that everyone uses. But we'll just go over high levels what these other uh, better ways to implement this, the better way to implement these things are. So the the most commonly used policy is LRU or least recently used, and all we really do here is just main a t maintain a timestamp of when a page was accessed by a query, and then when we have to select a page to evict from our buffer pool, we just choose the one with the the the, the, the oldest timestamp. Right? Pretty easy. Um, to speed things up, then what maybe what we can do in, in our in our page table or, or our buffer pool list of frames, we can maybe sort them ahead of time by the by their timestamp. I mean, just always pop things out and move it to the end as every time they're accessed. So that way when it comes time to evict something, we just look at the head of that list and just those are the pages we want to go ahead and remove. Another approach that's commonly used is called clock. You can think clock is, is just an approximation of an LRU. Uh, I know this is used in a couple systems. Uh, this is actually used also in Linux, roughly, uh, for their page, or buff, uh, page replacement policy. So the basic idea is that you're going to maintain a simple bit for every single page that tells you whether it's, it has been accessed since the last time you checked it. And then every time you do access it, you, you just set that bit to 1. And then there's just going to be this clock hand that's going to go around in this circular buffer and just checks every, you know, every page to see whether it was accessed the last time it was, it, the clock hand went around. So say we have four buffers like this, or four pages like this, uh, one, two, three, four. Every page is going to have a, a reference bit, and initially it's always set to zero. So when I start off, uh, if, if, a, if a query accesses this page, I just go ahead and flip the bit to one. And then now there's this clock hand that gets moves around in a circular fashion. Every single time I need to go evict a page, it just you know it looks at the next one and decides whether uh, the, the bit is zero. If yes, it can be evicted. If it's one, then it keeps it. But it resets it, resets it to, to, to zero. So at the very beginning, the clock says I need to evict something. So I'm, I'm pointing to the first guy. Uh, I set it, it set to one, so I, I know I don't want to throw it away, but I'll go ahead and set it to zero. So then I come down to the next guy, his reference counter is zero. So I know it's not been, it has not been accessed since the last time I came around. So it's safe for me to go ahead and evict this, and I can replace it with, with another page. Then I keep going around the clock like this to say page three and four have been accessed. So when I come around, I keep that, keep, keep page three, keep, keep page four. But page one has not been accessed since the last time I checked. So I can go ahead and throw that away. Right? It's an approximation to LRU because it's essentially giving you the same thing, but instead of saying what's the global timestamps of how, how things are accessed, it's just an approximation of whether it was accessed since the last time that I checked. Right? Less metadata, less overhead of maintaining the linked list. Right? A lot of systems do this because it's pretty easy. The problem with LRU and clock is that they are susceptible to the, to the issue of what's called sequential flooding. So this is the examples I was showing before where if we were doing a sequential scan over, over, over the entire table, the pages I just read in to, to, you know, as, as I was scanning down is actually the most useless page that I actually need. And now if I have a bunch of other pages that may be accessed a lot by other queries, the sequential scan is going to go through and blow the, all those pages away because it's going to fetch in a bunch of pages and then not need them anymore. Right? You're essentially polluting the buffer pool with pages that you need once and then you don't need it ever again. So in, in this case here, LRU is actually the exact opposite of what you want. The policy you really want is the most recently used, at least in the case of the sequential scan. Right? So to sort of illustrate this, I, I have one query, let's do a sequential scan, or I have one query, uh, I'll start off with one query that's going to access a single tuple, right, and say that's in page one. I go ahead and fetch it and bring it to my, into my buffer pool, and I'm done. Page one goes away. Now I start, sorry, query one goes away. Query two starts executing, and it does a sequential scan, and again, it's going to fill up the buffer pool with all the pages that it reads. So now I get to page three. I need to decide what page I want to evict. If I'm using LRU or clock, it'll be page zero, because that's the one that was last, the least recently used. I go ahead and evict that. But now another query comes along that does the exact same thing that the first guy did. And it wants page, page zero, but that just got evicted. So it'll choose page one, choose, choose something else. So again, I have to do an additional read 
for something that I just threw away. So the ways to avoid this is to sort of special case the sequential scan and recognize that it's doing the sequential scan and it's unlikely to read that data again. Now, if another query comes along and does the same sequential scan, that's unavoidable. We'll have to go fetch those things in. But if I'm doing these sort of, uh, if I have a skewed workload where I'm always trying to maybe access the first page or first small number of pages, I don't want to evict those guys. So three different ways to handle this are through LRUK, uh, pri uh, priorities, and localization. So with LRUK, is, it's basically like LRU, but then rather than just keeping a single timestamp of when the tuple was last accessed, I'm actually going to keep a history of all these accesses. And then from the history, I can then compute the intervals of the time from when the tuple was accessed the first, you know, at one point, and then how long it took before it was accessed again. And now the idea here is I can use this history to estimate what's the likelihood that this tuple is going to be accessed in the near future. And if that, if that time is greater than all the other times, then that's the one I actually want to evict. Right? So my, in my example I showed in the last slide, the, the, the first tuple is what all those queries, the first, the first and third query we're accessing, the first page. So if I recognize I had a history of that, oh, I'm going to access this page over and over again, and I know how long in between I'm going to access those things, then that first page would actually be, would be considered more important and should stay in memory, whereas the other ones were used for the sequential scan, and it'll be a long time before they're accessed again, so I can go ahead and evict those. Right? And so the K in LRUK basically says, how much of a history do you want to maintain? Right? Because you could keep infinite history of this, but then that's, again, that's a, that's a large storage overhead. So typically, uh, typically K equals 1 is, is, is a very common approach for people that do this. Right? And, and it works reasonably well. Another uh, way to handle this is called localization, where you, you rather than having the, the, the sequential scan access the global buffer pool and pollute it with the pages that it wants to read, you can actually just keep the pages that it reads. Uh, you can keep, you can sort of confine the, the query to a subset of the buffer pool and don't let it pollute the entire thing. So my example I showed in Postgres, remember I showed the, the number of reads versus hits. The number of hits was, was only 32. And this is because Postgres, when it f you first execute a special scan, it only gives you a 32 page local buffer for you to put your sequential scan pages in there. And that, again, that avoids polluting the, the entire buffer pool space. Um, the, the way some systems, in the case of Onformix, will have uh, a private memory that's not in the buffer pool. I think Postgres actually backs them with pages that are in the buffer pool as well. Right? It, not one way is not better than another. The avoiding having to go to the page table would obviously is faster because you don't have to take latches. But uh, at a high level, the how it affects the buffer pool is 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 roughly the same whether it's local or or, or global. The last approach is use priority hints, and this is where you tell the buffer pool something about the context about how the pages were accessed or what actually what's inside of them. So we saw a little bit of this already when we talked about having different buffer pool instances that were allocated for either data pages or index pages. Right, but you can go even more fine-grained than that and say, well, how, you know, it may be an index page, or, but how is it actually going to be accessed again in the future? Right? And then this allows the buffer pool manager to then make decisions about whether, uh, you know, whether one page should be evicted versus another. So let's say that we have an index. Again, we, ha we have index pages for our nodes. If we have a query that wants to do an insert, and say that we're doing uh, insert with a primary key that's, that's, uh, that's auto-incremented, or it's monotonically increasing. So every single tuple has ID 1, the next one has ID 2, and so forth. We always count up, right? So when we do these inserts, what's going to happen is we're going to end up always inserting to this side of the tree because it's, if it's based on ID, then all the new entries always end up on this side. So what we can do is we can maybe provide hints to the buffer pool manager and say, we know that these pages are always the ones that, that are going to be accessed every time I do a in, new insert, because they're always on this side of the tree. So they should have higher priority than maybe then some other pages in, in, in the index. Right? Again, this avoids having the problem of, again, since I always know I'm going to go down this side, I don't want to have to do a page fetch every single time I, I do an insert. 
Another thing you can do also too is say I have queries that are just doing a random key lookup uh, anywhere in, in the tree. In that case, maybe all the, the nodes will be accessed uniformly, um, but there's always going to be one node or, or a subset of nodes that I know I'm always going to access every single time I do this lookup, right? And that's going to be the root because I can't get in the index any other way. So we can essentially tell the, the, the buffer pool manager that this page, don't even bother recording how often it's accessed. I know that this thing should always be in memory because every time I do a lookup, I'm always going to go to it. Then you can actually de do even more complicated things. You can recognize that, well, I have five indexes, but everyone's always going to this one, so then this one should have higher priority than all the other indexes. So this is what the commercial systems do. So the commercial systems have all sorts of uh, you know, extra hooks and extra information that provide their buffer managers to allow them to make better decisions than the open source guys. Right? This is sort of what separates the, the sort of expensive enterprise systems from the, the open source ones. Open source ones like Postgres and MySQL are still very good, but the, the buffer pool management policies in the commercial ones are much more sophisticated, much more complex. All right, the next thing we want to talk about that we've sort of have, have, have been ignoring this entire time is how do we deal with pages that, that have been modified, that have been dirty? So everything I've shown so far, I just assumed, yeah, I, I need to read a page, I need, I need to make space, I'll evict another one. I just throw it away, right? The, the page in the buffer pool that I, I want to replace, I don't need to worry about it, about storing anything, I just, I just drop it and go ahead and take its frame. But in real systems, obviously, we can, we're going to update data. It means we're updating data in, in, the, in the pages, and that means we have to write them back out the disk. So there's, this, again, this is another example of the trade-offs we have to make in our replacement policy because... The easiest thing to do would be just only choose pages that are, are, that are not dirty and drop them, right? But then at some point, you're going to have a bunch of pages that are going to be dirty, and you have to make a decision. Or there may be pages like the root of the index that I'm going to read all the time. I may, never, I may not actually update it a lot, but I, I don't want to drop it because I'm going to have to go through the index that way. So there's this trade-off between deciding, do I, when I evict a page, do I do the fast thing and just drop a page that's, that's clean, or do I actually need to write back a page that's dirty? It'd be more expensive, but maybe a page that I know I'm not going to need in the future. Right? So because again, if I choose a page that's dirty, I have to write it out. Now, there's a whole other issue we have to deal with about logging and, and making sure we write pages at the right time, but we'll cover that later in the semester. So one way to preemptively take care of this problem so that you know when we need to evict a page, we don't have to immediately write it back, is that we can do background writing where we periodically walk through the page table, find any dirty pages, and then make a decision about whether we, we want to go ahead and write them out the disk ahead of time. So now, when we do that, we can decide whether we want to evict it right then and there, or we keep it in memory and we just flip it to be from the dirty bit to be clean. So that when the eviction policy runs again, it, it now has a clean page that it knows it can throw away. Right? So Postgres does this. Um, I don't know if MySQL does this. But a bunch of the commercial systems do sort of the same thing. Um, the issue we, we're going to have to talk about later when we talk about logging recovery is that we can't write out a dirty page to disk until the log that the log that corresponds to the change that was made to that page is written out the disk, right? And there's a whole process of figuring out what pages are safe to write based on what 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 you've written to the log. And then of course, obviously, there's this uh, contention issue now where. I may be trying to write data out the, to the log as fast as possible, and I don't want the, the background writer to interfere with this, but I want my background writer to go ahead and write out 30 pages because that'll free up slots or free up frames in memory. All right, so how do you balance all these things is really tricky, and there's no, there's no magical way to do this. People sort of have these default settings, um, and you can tune them a little bit, but it's, it's, it's very application-specific. It's very difficult to get right. All right, to finish up, uh, the last two things to talk about are allocation policies and uh, the different types of memory pools you can have. So for allocation policies, it's basically how do we make decisions about how much memory to give to different threads or to different, different queries, and do we make decisions about doing this for the, the entire system, or do we have localized policies that say, uh, you know, for this, for this given transaction, this given query, it's allowed this amount of memory, and we don't care about any, anybody else. So again, there's, there's this again, trade-off of trying to make decisions that will maximize performance without having to you know, punish any one query the, the most. 
And again, there's no magic way to do this. It's sort of th these things that being back in your mind when you make decisions about how you actually implement your buffer pool manager. And the last piece to talk about is the other memory pools that, that are running inside the system. So everything we talked about here before today is just I need to read a tuple, it's not a page, I go bring that into my buffer pool. But there's all this other stuff we have to maintain in memory that may or may not be backed by pages on disk that we now have to consider as well. So when we do query processing, we'll see this when we do sorting and joins. Uh, those things need, need, need memory, obviously, and we have to decide where we're actually going to put that memory. So some things will just be allocated on the heap, uh, usually like in, in, a, in a memory pool or an arena for a given query or thread. But other things you actually want to back behind the buffer pool so that if you need more memory to run your query than it's actually available to you, then you can have the buffer pool swap those things out to disk. So a lot of times you'll see um, systems talk about, you know, I run a query and I run out of memory. It's usually because the query is not backed by, the, 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 the intermediate results are not backed by the buffer pool and it can't write those things out the disk. So in Postgres, some things will be backed by disk, like for doing hash joins. But there's other cases where like, if you, we've seen, I don't have a query to show you right now, but we have ways of like concatenating a bunch of strings together and it'll just run out of memory because it's not backing this by the buffer pool, it's just stored in the heap. So the, the main takeaway from this is that different systems do different things. Sometimes all these different types of memory uh, pools that you need will just be in the heap and sometimes they'll actually be backed by the buffer pool. Ideally, uh, well, there's no one way that's better than another because again, if it's backed by the buffer pool, then you have to update a page table, you have to update all that extra information. If you just malloc on the heap, that's super fast, but then you, can, you, you don't have full control of the amount of memory you may be actually be using. Okay. So the main takeaway from this is that the, 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 the database system is always going to do a much better job than the, the operating system for managing memory. Um, you don't want to use MMAP. You don't want to rely on in virtual memory. You want to do everything yourself because this is going to allow you to have to leverage the information that you know about the queries you're executing to order to make better decisions on, on their policies about how you move data back and forth. Okay? And with the exception of Postgres, most database systems do not rely on the file system cache. They do everything themselves. Okay. So, given this lecture, this is a nice segue now to what the first project is. So the first project is, you guys got to build a buffer pool, right? So, uh, the project is going to be going out today. I'll post it online immediately after class. You're going to have three parts. You have to build a, a hash table, a replacement policy, and the actual manager themselves. So, this year, all of the projects were based on SQLite. Uh, we looked at trying to make use Postgres, but it was, it was just sort of more complicated. And we didn't have enough time to do this. But basically, SQLite is going to be the front end to your to your the database sort of engine you're building um, as as what's called a virtual table. So you, what will happen is you'll you'll start up SQLite and you say create me a table using my sort of virtual table extension, and then any reads reads and writes will go to your to, to the engine that you're building. So for the first project, you don't actually need to use any SQLite. You don't actually need to look at the internals on SQLite throughout the entire semester. We're, we're hiding all that from you. You, just, you work on your own C++ code base. So the, the project will be due in two weeks on September 26th. You'll submit this on, on Gradescope. Well, again, we'll, we'll turn all this on uh, later today to at least get started. So the first task is that you have to build an extendable hash table. So I'll explain what, it, what an extendable hash table is next class. But this is, this is, you're going to end up using this as your page table. So it's a hash table that can grow. So that way, as, as you insert new data and you make new pages, your hash table can grow with it to keep track of these things. So for this, uh, you don't need to support shrinking, because that's actually harder to do. But you, do, you need to support growing, and the basic extendable hash table algorithm will do that for you. Um, you're allowed to use some of the things that are in the STL. So this would be all S, S, or C++ 11. So you can use std hash as your hashing function. You can use std mutex to protect this. Right? This, this needs to be thread safe. Um, you can't just use S std map. Right? You, just, you have to build your own hash map. Okay? <laughs> One kid tried to do that last year. Don't, don't do that. The next thing you got to build is the replacement policy. So you're going to have to build LRU. Um, and you don't have to worry about. Um, the, 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 way, the way we sort of extracted out the APIs, you don't actually, actually have to worry about whether uh, it's, it's, it's pinned or not. 
you just know that these are the pages that, that are free and I have to make a decision about which ones I actually want to evict. Okay? This, this part should be pretty straightforward. And then you're going to put the, the LRU management policy that you implemented plus your extendable hash table and actually build now your own buffer pool manager. So we will take care of reading and writing data from, from disk. Right? We'll provide you an API to say, give me this page from disk. And it knows where to go get it. Um, but you have to then make a copy of the page into, into your hash map or your, in your internal data structure and then map any page IDs to it. Right? So the tricky thing about this that, that, that sort of fouls up students is that you want to make sure you get the operations correct when you do pinning. Right? If, if you, know, you don't want to do a lookup and it's not there, then try to pin something to, to take, a, take a slot, to take a frame. You have to always have to pin first because another thread could come in and take, take, your, take your location. Um, yeah, this part, this, I mean, this part is, is, this part is the more, more complicated part of all of this. It's sort of putting everything together. Um, but again, it, it, we're only giving you two weeks because it is actually not that bad, in my opinion. So the way to get started is that uh, when we post it online today, download the source code. We'll give you a tarball uh, that'll have a bunch of, of, of stub files that, that, that you can run or you can implement your actual code. So the code, when you download it, should be, be able to, you should be able to compile it. Right, so you test that right away. The, the, we've, again, we, we have APIs, we have functions you actually have to implement with documentation inside them. It, the tests will fail because obviously you haven't written any of your code, but you should be able to compile it. So you should do that right away and check your, your, your development environment. So we've tested all the Android machines uh, that are in Gates. They, everything should compile on that. There's no sort of crazy uh, dependencies to make this all work. Um, we know it works on OS X, we know it works on Linux. Uh, although I have a Windows laptop, I don't use it for anything other than PowerPoint. Uh, I don't know whether it actually compiles on Windows 10 with the Ubuntu package. I think a student last year got it to work, but I, I don't know what you know. I don't know what, whether it worked out of the box. Um, if you can't, if you don't have access to a Linux machine or machine you can actually use to compile on this, email me. We can give you like a virtual machine image that that if you want to run run it that that way. But everyone should access should have access to the Android machine if you're a, a student here. And it should work there. All right, so the, the instructions will lay out exactly what files you need to modify. You should not modify any other files in, in the, so the tarball we give you. Because when we run your tests, right, when you upload the grade scope, we're going to pick out those six files that we asked you to modify, and we're going to overlay them into our you know, sort of clean co code base. So if you mo there's something you have to modify to make your thing to work that aren't in those six files, it will fail when, when we actually run it because we're not going to copy those things in. right? The other thing to say, too, is that the four projects in the class are all cumulative. So you need to get this thing working before you can do the subsequent things. Right? You can't build an index unless you have a buffer pool. And you can't do a uh, concurrent control unless you have an index. So we would not be providing solutions because of this. Uh, in, ca in, in cases last year where some kids had problems due to medical reasons, we can give you, a, you know, an obfuscated, tarball, or obfuscated binary that will implement some of the files that you may be missing. And so that way you, you can keep, keep up, right? But for the most part, we set these deadlines such that you, you, you sort of keep implementing things and you, you'll, you'll have enough time to do them in order to get started on the next project, okay? So if you have questions about, about basic things or the high-level ideas or where to find certain things in the code, post them on Piazza. Do not post on Piazza like, I get a seg fault, I don't understand why, right? We're not gonna help you debug. There's, we have tutorials online that we'll send you guys how to use GDB, right? how to do basic things with C++11, but we're not going to come sit and look at your code with you. Okay. The last thing I'll say too is that please do not plagiarize. We will run the MOS uh, uh, detector. Please also do not post your thing publicly on GitHub because uh, again, we don't want other people just taking your code. right? You can set a private repo if you want. And I realize a lot of you want to be able to show your, to your employers Here's the project, projects I've done. That actually doesn't matter, right? They don't care. Cause, no, because because you're all implementing the same thing. It's not like you have this magical breakthrough, right? In the little code you're writing for our projects, okay? So don't post the things on GitHub's. Don't cheat. Don't copy from each other. If you have questions, email me. And then next class, hash tables, okay? Have a good weekend. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite all pattern. Uh, <laughs> no. What is it? Yes! It's the S-T-Cricket I-D-E-S.
I make a mess unless I could do it like a Geo. Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, Duke. I play the game where there's no rules. The homies on the cup say I'm a fool cause I drink fruit. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watt, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of a boy. Six pack 48 gets the real pounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. Yeah.